Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for everyone for joining. Uh, so I'm going to start off with the why and the format of this webinar is a little different. I think we can have the other experts chime in um, whenever they feel like it, which is absolutely okay, and ask a lot of questions because I think it's very nice to have these experts with us um, to answer your questions. Uh, and it's really just about you know learning one or two things, but I think there's an opportunity to ask a lot of questions and learn a lot. And so just two sentences about Sierra. You know, we're a prototype fabricator located in the Bay Area. And what makes us different is we are a complete end-to-end uh, -end design, fabrication, assembly, and components. Uh, we don't outsource anything. And that allows us to control the cycle time and the quality. And it gives a lot of feedback to the designers, uh, which is great. Um, Lucy already introduced the speakers. Hammond is also included on that uh, as a very important person. And then here is the agenda for today. So really the, the thing that the whole industry should be tackling is why are we still using Gerber? Um, so we'll talk about that and then you know dive into the details about what kind of problems the 2581 solves. Uh, and then uh, there'll be a demo, a couple of demos for you as well. Okay, so what's wrong with Gerber? Well, you guys all know apparently what's wrong with Gerber. It's individual file formats and it's very easy for a designer to forget something or miss something. Uh, and you know, when we're looking at many, many designs per day, we see all those issues uh, come up. Uh, some some designers have been doing this for a long time and, and they get everything perfect every time. Fantastic. Um, if you're a younger designer, you know, it's very easy to miss some data. So Gerber just isn't up to the mark uh, for that, especially if you're doing any sort of complex uh, designs. For example, if you have something with multiple drill files, in, inevitably, we see customers forgetting to include a drill file or you know there's something some issue with the drill files because uh, there's not just one drill, drill file. And then definitely there's no intelligence to Gerber. So you'd have to include information like you know layer ordering and uh, you know any any kind of special like, hey, what is this file for? Because we don't know, right? So you have to really go into detail. So it's like adding the metadata on top of the Gerber in a separate in a separate file. So it's it ends up being very error prone. So one of the things, yeah, sir. go ahead. No, so actually, one of the comments also I like to make is twenty five years of playing on the other side. Um, this is Patrick Davis, by the way. My apologies. One of the things with 25 years of being in the field is everybody does this is as you're going ahead and processing out and you make, oh, shoot, I got to change one thing on this silk layer or one thing on this negative plane. I'll just slip that in. By end up having individual files, how many times have you guys been uh, stung by putting it together, shipping it back out? And then, again, oh, wait a minute, you put this one file in, but you don't have the flash on it or you, the drills actually moved and everything. By having a single file format where you have one file that gets put out every single time, you know that everything is going to be in sync, and that's extremely important. That's the biggest difference between I-2581 and Gerber. Plus, the intelligence is another huge part of it because you don't rely, and uh, Amit can uh, comment on this, is you're, you've got the CAM operators sitting there, and they've got to bring in the IPC, um, uh, the uh, 356 netlist, and actually do an overlay, and there's always you're guessing a little bit and every single time you're doing this. Yeah, oh, we're doing thousands and thousands of these guessed, but with IPC 2581, there is no guessing. It just makes it work really, really well. So I don't know why people, I know why people still do Gerber because you've always done it. I think it's some time to think about doing IPC 2581 instead. It just makes your life easier. Absolutely. Uh, well said, well said for sure. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of, you know, how things are done today um, is, you know, not so good. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to go through it so people can kind of see what's going on. So whenever we get Gerber, 
um, we do have to, you know, import that into, um, in our case, we're using um, front frontline Genesis system uh, where we run all, all of our DFMs. And so we have to go through the input module for that tool. And the input module is absolutely, you know, guessing as to what file is what. And so then we have to, you know, manually make sure that, yeah, this is, this looks right. And, and there can be some, you know, file format issues and, you know, all that. So this is how we go through it today. Um, very error prone and, and very, um, very manual. So one of the things when you go back to that previous slide sure. is you can take a look over here at the path names. You notice that every single um, CAD software has a different way of outputting everything. And it literally, and, and then of course, every single company ended up putting different suffixes onto it. So the CAM operator is bringing this in and it's like, well, what the devil's going where? By using the 2581, we actually eliminate, we actually have a way of telling you exactly what layer is for what. And we'll get into that when Vince goes through our process at the very end here. So it becomes very easy and there's no more interpreting data. Again, that, that the biggest difference between the Gerber and between 2581 is you're not asking the CAM operator to actually think about, hey, what does he really mean by this? It's very simple. No, this is exactly what it means. Yeah, no, perfect. And Lucy, are we doing a, a Sierra doing a stack of demo? Yes, uh, Vandana and Damodar are here. They're going to show you how to run the stack of designer and how to export the files uh, with IPC 2581. Okay, okay, great. So just a little setup here is that, you know, Sierra is not a CAD tools provider, uh, but we have worked hard on the stack of tool. And that one portion, can be outputted as a 2581 uh, format. So I'll stop sharing and let, let the design team share that. Hi everyone. Um, our PCB stackup designer tool provides manufacturable and cost optimized stackups and also includes an impedance calculator. The tool allows you to change the signal plane combination and the copper weights in the generated stackup. It also allows you to download the stack up data in IPC standard 2584. We start by entering the project name. Project name, for example, demo or revision number, the PCB size, a target PCB thickness, PCB material, and a PCB type. You can also use the material selector compare guide to choose your materials. Click on this option one if you know the number of layers required in the design, or on option two if you have a complex BGA that dictates the uh, layers in your design. Uh, choose the layer count, a signal plane layer combination, and click on Run Stack Up Designer. You will be presented with a list of Sierra Circuit's recommended stackups uh, and some basic stackup for information. Click on the Report button here to view the final stackup that resembles your final buildup. Here on the report page, you can view the attributes without going back to the previous page. And if you do any changes here in the board properties, you can click on generate custom stack up to update. Scroll further for a detailed construction of the stack up. Here you can change the layer type from signal to plane or mixed. And the copper percentage will be automatically adjusted. You can click on this cross symbol to remove the solder mask. Scroll further for the inbuilt impedance calculator. Uh, this calculator here allows you to add controlled impedance and compute the trace width and trace spacing for a target impedance. Click on this plus sign here. And for a signal layer in target impedance, you can add in the model type, select a reference layer, and click on calculate. You can see that the trace width is calculated here. Uh, click on the save button here um, to save the stack of data in uh, IPC standard 2581. Uh, clicking on this button generates an ID that allows you to access the stack up in the next login sessions. If you click on this export to IPC 2581, the stack up data is imported in a .xml file, which can be implemented to any ECAT tool which supports IPC 2581. Uh, we have Damodar here now, who will show you how to view these files in cables. Over to you, Damodar. Thank you, Vandana. Hello everyone. 
I am going to show you how to import stackup data into Allegro tool using IPC 2581. After exporting the IPC file the, from the stackup tool, the format will be XML format. To import the file into the tool, open the tool, go to setup, cross section, go to import, select IPC 2581. Say yes. Go to your location. Select the file. Say open. Once imported, there will be a report generated to cross check the data. This will save time when you having multi layer boards and also don't have to add details manually. Thank you. This is great. I love how you guys have this capability inside of uh, Sierra Circuits and being able to bring your own net list, or bring your own stack ups and play with it. As all of you know, you get five, six, seven, eight stack ups um, every single design. Sometimes you get one stack up if you're really lucky. And how many times have you actually gone in and made a mistake in the stack up? And it's just like you're copying it in and you fat finger something and you get the wrong impedance or you get the wrong. Um, uh, thickness or the wrong type of copper. With the 2581 data, it makes it all very, very simple. Less manual input, the better everybody is at. And then you can just file import, then you save the files. This is a great starting point moving forward. And it makes everything easy because Sierra Circuits has this and they go, this is the stack up that we can actually do. They know where it's coming from. Um, it, it literally will save you guys a lot of time and a lot of ECO back and forth. I mean, how many people have gotten a, a message back from your uh, fab vendor going, hey, um, we can't do this. We got to make this exceptions. We got to move. We got to change the thickness on this or we got to change the line width on this in order to make your impedance tolerance. With Sierra, guess what? You never have to worry about that. And with the 2581, you're never going to make a mistake with file import done. Really simple. I love this. This is great, guys. Oh, thanks for that. Uh, so let's see. Um, just going back to like the process a little bit, right? So once we get the data into our into our systems or DFM systems, um, we're running um, all of our DFM checks, uh, and you know it isn't there is an operator here who is reviewing the the um, the callouts that come back, like, hey, is this actually an, uh, an issue or not? Um, so all that is done. And when we're, when we're done with that, which can take, uh, time, you know, like hours, um, we then have to, after we're done with like these, these types of these manual checks, um, uh, you know, we have to go back to the designer and say, Hey, you know, these are kind of issues that we found, whether it's, you know, solder mask or you know, trace violations, trace space violations, whatever it may be. Um, you know, this is this is what we do. We go back offline and and some fabricators may send a spreadsheet, some fabricators may send an email, some fabricators, you know, I don't know what people do. So that's not the best, that's not the best process, but that's how the industry has evolved. And you know, Gerber has been the backbone of manufacturing. Uh, but it's really not up to the task anymore. And so that's pretty much where 2581 comes in, right? So I think the industry has gone to a point where, in at least in the U.S. for sure, that there's one uh, manufacturer that's doing fab PCB fabrication and assembly. Uh, and But there really isn't, other than 2581, a good single data exchange that houses all that information for the fabricator to do their work where Gerber pretty much is just PCB information and it's not even very complete and then now you have additional files for the assembly side and so 2581 is the file format that can address and does address all these things um, for a, a fabricator at this point and then of course there's the back and forth um, which 2581 can also can also handle. So how does 2581 address 
the uh, NPI challenges. Uh, so we've touched on a few and I hope to hear from Hammond as well, but uh, 2581 streamlines the stack up exchange of information um, and the, uh, the DPMX standardizes crucial characteristics like dielectric properties, uh, material specs, and uh, any kind of coding details, um, layer thicknesses uh, for signal power ground layers. Uh, so all that and more is included with the 2581. So uh, in short, in short, uh, uh, if you think about 2581, uh, the file has everything you need to build and test the board. So we can get into more details a little later, but uh, uh, but you just think of it, everything you need is in one single intelligent file that has all the data you need to fabricate, assemble, and test the file, test the board. Absolutely. That's a very valid point. Uh, I was just on a call with a customer. They were concerned about the testing of their assembled product. And, uh, you know, we're looking at the information they provided us and it's uh, it was Gerber. And uh, they they actually got the Gerber converted to 2581 so that we could do proper testing. Uh, so if you have the opportunity right now to output your data at, at, as 2581, I, I would definitely do that. It's much better for for everything. So I think, yeah. in regards to that, um, being at a contract manufacturer prior to my time here at Cadence, this was common. It was as soon as you get up onto on the assembly side of it and you're doing a flying probe or bed of nails or anything else like that, the testers really need a good net list. And it was very, very common. They would give us Gerbers and then we'd end up asking for, hey, we need a real net list. We need to understand. We also need to understand the bomb. Um, 2581 has the bomb and AVL actually embedded into it, which is extremely powerful. That's something that the Gerber process doesn't do. You get a separate file. And then once you have separate files, is, is it actually in sync? As everybody knows, as soon as you end up Gerbering something out, um, or doing a manufacturing output on something, it's very common for the electrical engineers, as clever ducks as they are, to change something on you because, oh, hey, I can get this as a, I want to put this from a 1K to a 10K. Um, well, that becomes a problem when you're actually going through the testing process. Um, this becomes very, very valuable and having a single output that actually standardizes on top of it. And the bomb for testing is valuable along with a, a net list that actually has all the information and all the traceability inside of it. Perfect. And then, uh, you know, just there's benefits to having an open standard. Um, you know, 2581 is, is a completely open standard and any software vendor can reference um, the spec and, 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 and write their software to it, just as Sierra has written software, just as Cadence has written software. Um, it's just, it's very easy to, you know, get to that spec. And, you know, incorporating all the information in there makes it a very rich set of data, including uh, version control, as Patrick was talking about, and having it as a bi-directional sync between a manufacturer and uh, a designer, uh, you know, is, I would say, you know, groundbreaking and excellent for our industry. And there's always like a, a fine rope to walk there because we are not the customer and the customer is not us. So how much data do you wanna share? How do you wanna share? You know, those are always questions, but a 2581 comes to a nice happy medium on that, um, you know, type of a scenario. So I think it's, it's great. And, you know, let's talk about Rev B and C. Um, <clears throat> Because as just, uh, I, comment, yeah. uh, just before yeah. you go to B and C, I just wanted to yeah. comment that um, um, 2581 has what we call function modes. 
that allow the designer to pass the data that is needed. So if you are sending the data for fabrication, you only set the fabrication data. It's one intelligent file that has all the data needed to fabricate the, and test the board. But if you're doing, you're sending a file for assembly, you can just send the assembly data. So it has inbuilt capabilities to partition the data. So you still have complete data for the task you are sending the data for, uh, but you don't have to do send more data than you need to for a specific task. Um, if you are sending all of it to one, one supplier to do the fabrication assembly and test, like you would send it to ERA, uh, then you can send all of the data together. Uh, but like Amit said, it, it sends just the right amount of data for fabricating, assembling, and test, testing the board. One other comment I'd like to go on this is if anybody has been gotten one of those famous error codes from ODB++ of like, hey, I can't read this, it's in this file, and you look at the file structure of it, of ODB++, I've actually had problems with Windows in the past saying it's too deep. I had 65 layer of 65 um, different folders inside of folders or something crazy like that, where we end up having the streamline process of IPC 2581 is a single XML file and it zips down into a very compact, about half the size of anything else. Okay, awesome. Uh, Hemant, uh, I was looking through the questions and I know we're probably going to get to the end and do more questions and answers, but uh, I think this is, we missed this one, like what's the difference between 2581 and ODB? Can you answer that one, Hemant? Uh, the difference between uh, what, I'm sorry? ODB data, ODB++ and uh, 2581. Sure. So, so um, I would start out by saying that they're both intelligent data. Uh, ODB++ happens to be proprietary data, so it's owned by a specific company, whereas 2581 is an open standard, and it's an IPC standard, which is created, maintained, enhanced, and, and revved based on industry input, not on a specific company's business cases for which features to add, and which features not to add. So it's 2581 is for the industry by the industry. Whereas ODB++ is, is owned by Siemens and they do not necessarily react to a, a company's request to enhance ODB++ unless you are their customer. So you have to be a Siemens customer to get priority on any fixes that you want on that, any issues you might have. Um, so, and, and I think Patrick just talked about a, a one additional thing about you know, when you use ODB++, sometimes you get error messages that you um, you don't know what to do with. Uh, there are other cases uh, with ODB++ uh, that are not, uh, it doesn't do. So the other, other big difference is 2581 is bi-directional. So as Amit showed you earlier in the presentation is that you have a stack of exchange. The stack of exchange only works with 2581, doesn't work with ODB++ or Gerber. Um, now, the next section that Amit is going to talk about is also DFM exchange. The revision C uh, of, of the standard allows DFM data to go back and forth between the design house and the manufacturer. Today, that data goes through electronic paper where you send your package over to your manufacturing partner. Manufacturing partner sends you some uh, reports saying, I've got a question here, I've got a question there. You got to take that report, interpret it, go back to your design tool, try to understand what exactly is being talked about, and then respond accordingly. And that's a manual process inserted uh, going back and forth. With 2581, the DFM data can be passed between the manufacturer and the design house and the design tool electronically in intelligent format. So you open up your design tool then you can open up the DFM data feedback and it will take you back to where the specific issue is and you can respond to it and send the answer back through 2581. So it's a much more streamlined, much better uh, process with revision C of 2581. I think you want to add anything? 
Yeah, I got one more thing to add on top of that. One of the things that I've seen with the um, ODB++ data is you end up having, it doesn't look the same as what's in your um, board file. We actually had this a lot. There's a lot of comparisons. There's a couple of things in the ch open chats here about, hey, comparing the data and, and doing a, a uh, layover, especially with thermals on uh, negative planes. And with ODB++, you have to have your thermal file and everything else and tie it in. With 2581, it's intelligent enough to actually pull, especially from the Capus tools, it pulls it out natively, so you end up having to only do one interpretation of it. We've had some consortium members in the past, and I think Hemet can comment on this too, is when they switched over to 2581 for their very, very large company inside Silicon Valley, um, one of the big guys, and when they switched over to uh, running 2581 as their standard for all their manufacturing, um, they found that, hey, this isn't coming out like what we thought it would be. It doesn't match the ODB++. Well, ODB++ was taking liberties and changing things. The 2581 was actually very close, was exactly what was inside the board file to start with. So they had to actually unlearn and stop a lot of the patches that they put in for ODB++, especially when you're being hypersensitive to um, flashes and some of the negative data, that uh, negative plane data that was going on. So it just makes it clean it is really what it does. Yeah, and uh, I think that's great. And, you know, I this is new for our industry. I mean, relatively new. Uh, the industry has been, you know, reliant on one thing, Gerber. And, and finally, we have something that is better, but it's still going to take some getting used to. And, and so hopefully people on this call are the, uh, you know, kind of the people who will push their organizations uh, to to move to something different. So there is that, you know, change uh, that needs to happen. And so I guess uh, the first thing is, I hope this part, I mean, we're more, more than half done with the presentation. I hope people on the, on, on the call realize that the way that's happening today is not good enough and that 2581 offers enough benefits to now, you know, move towards 2581 and you know just make that make a calculated and you know yeah, a calculated change uh, within the organization so i think that's a key thing so going back to some of the benefits um you know there's still more benefits i mean i think we could do a whole another whole hour on the benefits of 2581 but uh you know rev c um has improvements and just stating that, you know, there are improvements that are being always incorporated and talked about. I mean, that's a big deal. So um, that alone is is amazing. So hats off to him and other consortium members. But Rev C basically, you know, works with Flex, uh, Flex stackups, getting the right information over uh, to the fabricator on that. Um, and then, you know, version control is a, is a big part of it and component uh, configurations, um, all things that can be an issue, especially in NPI process, um, you know, getting the right information to the fabricator, uh, you know, isn't always easy uh, in NPI. So it can really help your NPI process out. Also is uh, impedance information as we've kind of alluded to um, so you can, you have different configurations of your transmission lines, you know, sending over that information properly and what you're looking for, um, you know, can be really helpful to the fabricator. And, you know, this might also take a mindset shift from designers uh, because some designers, they don't want to send too much information. They just say, you know, just do it as a controlled dielectric and that's it. But as electronics gets more complicated, as the number of, uh, you know, impedance structures that you have in your design gets more complicated. You really need a partner who can, you know, work through some of those things uh, with you uh, rather than just dictating it, a one-way flow of information. And this actually ties into something that was actually in the chat or in the questions here about, mm -hmm. yeah, when you end up having Gerbers come in and they play with the apertures to get the impedance matched up, as you can see from Sierra, they actually do all the calculations and their control processes are such that you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about changing the trace widths, et cetera, um, and having that plus or minus. That's a huge deal. 
Um, that is a huge, as a designer, sometimes, especially if you're doing RF or something else, you're actually calculating this information. I want to know what my impedance is. I want to know my 85 ohm differential. Um, I know my 50 ohm when I'm actually skipping down, I want it to be 15 mils wide and I'm skipping down minus two layers in order to get a lower inductance on the trace. That information with the way that Sierra is bringing this forward and with the IPC 2581 just prevents us from making mistakes. As, the, as it was said, is MPI. MPI is all about speed, speed and accuracy. If I don't have to manually put something in, oh my gosh, my life is better. We already do enough manual processes through the PCB design. This eliminates a lot of the manual mess ups that we end up doing. Yeah, very, very well said, Patrick. Uh, is Sierra doing a demo of the impedance calculator? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing then. And, and audience, please ask more questions. Uh, the Sierra Circuits Impedance Calculator uses the 2D numerical solution of Maxwell's equation for PCB transmission lines. It has a total of 82 impedance models with multiple geometries. Uh, the tool is also integrated with the signal loss, crosstalk calculator, and the S-parameter calculator. Uh, let us start with a coated microstrip in a differential pair. Uh, the simple and the composite models are displayed here. Uh, let's go with the simple model for now. Uh, the image of the chosen geometry will be displayed here on the left. And you can also choose a desired unit system. Uh, let's go with mills for now. Enter the dielectric information. Uh, for example, 3.348 for the dielectric height, a dielectric constant of 3.63, a coating height H1C of 1.5 mils, coating height H3C of 1.5 mils. Uh, the coating height uh, H2C and dielectric constant here are pre-filled but can be changed if desired. Then enter delta W, which is the difference between the top of the trace and the bottom of the trace. Uh, let's go with 0.5 for now. You can click on this help content here, which displays a table that suggests the delta W values based on the starting copper weight. Uh, enter the trace thickness, 1.45, and uh, trace separation, 7. Uh, you can enter a target differential impedance here, for example, 100 ohms, and click on calculate W to calculate the trace width here. You can alternatively also enter the trace width and then calculate the uh, differential impedance. You can see that there are the parameters here that are calculated and displayed too. Uh, you can then click on the signal loss here, calculator for the chosen geometry and enter a dissipation factor of frequency, for example, 10 gigahertz, a surface roughness, six microns, which is the most common and a length of or maybe and click on calculate loss. Uh, the signal loss will be calculated and displayed. And similarly, you can also cal use the S parameter calculator and also the crosstalk here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so... I think that honestly, there's enough benefit, as I said before, to 2581 at this point in the presentation. Um, but wait, wait, there's more. And I think that uh, the industry does need to honestly catch up to 2581 at this point, um, which is very exciting. Uh, but uh, there is a bi directional um, emphasis in Rev C. Uh, so all the DFM feedback um, that's given to a customer, you know, can go into this file. And I think we've addressed it, but I think just saying it again and repeating again, I think is, is really, is really critical. Uh, so, and then um, I think we have a demo uh, about 2581 and cadence Allegro. So I'm going to quickly go over these. Uh, then this is going back to the original, you know, importing uh, 2581 um, into the into the CAM software. Oh. And do we want to save the cadence demo for the end, or do you want to do that now? Until we talk about before we talk about 4.0.
I think this this would be a good place to do it. It's, it, it's a good continuation of what you were talking about. Yeah. If Vince is ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, great. Okay, if you want to stop sharing? Okay, I'll share my screen. Uh, where are we here? Screen three, share. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, so something that hasn't been touched upon, but before I show you how designers uh, export their final design on IPC 2581, um, IPC also has what are called IPC 2581 specs. And here I've got one file loaded that has different specs, fab notes, heat sink assembly, impedance, uh, et cetera. And uh, designers can create these notes. They can have um, various notes that they want to put in their, in their design, and they can assign them to different data elements within the design. So, you know, I can create an impedance saying, you know, this trace has to be 75 ohms plus or minus 3%. And I can assign it to C lines. As you see here, it's specified to be applied to C lines. And I can do that to, you know, I can create spec notes for any of these object types and assign them so that when I output my IPC 2581 file, these notes are, are part of those objects and are read by the CAM operators. So these notes don't get lost. Now, this is not meant to replace, you know, um, uh, drill data or, you know, uh, manufacturing notes, um, cadence. You may want to talk to your sales uh, person at cadence because now we are introducing live doc, uh, which is a whole new way to create manufacturing data. But I just wanted to make people on the call aware that the cadence tools do have this IPC 2581 specs that they can uh, assign notes to individual objects. So I'll get out of that really quickly. So when a design is complete, uh, such as this one, um, you know, designers can just do a file export 2581 and they're presented with this dialog. And the, the location of the folder, the file that's created is typically the same as the design folder. You, you're, you can uh, feel free to change the folder where you want the file to. Um, by default, we, we, we come out to IPC 2581B, but we also uh, we promote uh, that IPC 2581C should be used. And, and basically, 2581C uh, um, allows for um, the simplification of the functional mode that was alluded to by Amit before. Uh, so if, uh, you know, if I click on user def, I'm going to get the entire design, I can click on just bomb, stack up, fabrication, assembly, test, and stencil. So we talked about securing your data. <laughs> Excuse me. If I just want, you know, the fabrication data, I click on here and you saw that different things checked and unchecked here in the pane. Um, that means I'm not sending every file to the fabricator. I'm only sending the files that they are uh, in need of in order to manufacture the board. And, and then I would do the same for assembly and the same for test if I was using different uh, downstream vendors to, to manufacture, assemble, and test my board. Um, we also have uh, other capabilities about layer mapping and, and film creation if the, if the films haven't been set up. Um, but that, in, and also we have uh, the ability to export and uh, export. Uh, component and net attributes, this design doesn't have any, uh, but if they did and your downstream vendors wanted, uh, you know, the attributes uh, for say, you know, say components that uh, certain components needed to have, uh, you know, uh, a heat, uh, so much heat applied to it during assembly or a maximum amount of heat, you know, if that was an attribute on that component uh, and it was part of the design, of the component in that design, then it would get exported out as well. Uh, and then once you've made all your selections, uh, you just click on export and, and the file is generated. And then the file is made available either through your PLM system or by however, whatever method your company uses in order to uh, deliver the, the files to your downstream vendors. It's, it, I won't go into the, the file import and export for the stack up because that was already demonstrated very nicely. Uh, by the folks at Sierra. Um, but if anybody's got any questions on how you can 
change from you know what you do today of exporting Gerber to exporting 2581, please send me a message on the chat window and I'll be able to answer it for you. And hey, that's all wanna, I have. Yeah. I want to bring up something here real quick. The layer sure. map edit, uh, layer map editing, mapping edit. That's actually a very powerful tool because one of the things that we were talking about before is how do you make everything automated? How do you make everything move quickly? This allows you to say, hey, this is a documentation layer. All of us have those other layers inside of our Gerber files, inside of our manufacturing output files that are like, okay, this is a special documentation layer that my you're going to do um, potting or you're going to be doing a special test or something else like that. You can very easily set this up here. Yes. And then you're not actually having to put a note inside of the um, file, inside of the board or something else like this. That That's makes right. a huge difference. How do you avoid the manual process as we're doing things? So this is a very powerful tool. And the fact is, is that it allows you to set up a standardization of outputs that can be step and repeated again and again and again. Correct. That's all what it comes down to. Everybody, yeah. how do you not make a manual in entry into anything? Yeah, the, the, other, the other reason for this layer mapping is, is that the system automatically tries and detect, you know, what are my silkscreen layers? And in this case, you know, silkscreen top and silkscreen bottom, they're referenced to the silkscreen layers, right? So we've done a great job in, in, in detecting what are the silkscreen layers. But as we know, our tool allows for any layer to be added into the design, and it could be called VIN's top. Right, the system doesn't know that Vince Top is my silkscreen layer, so I can use this to say Vince Top is my is part of my silkscreen layers output. Okay, so that's the other way that this mapping dialog is used. But great point, Patrick. Like again, it's just how do you make it easy so when you guys push the button, you know it's done right. Yep, that's what it all comes down to. So Sierra, when they get the data, they just rock and roll, and they're not calling you up going, "Hey, we got a problem here." Because you know that the fab shops always call you on a Friday at five o'clock. And sorry, sorry about that, but if Sarah, but that's, eh, it happens. But it's like, how do you prevent that from happening? And it's simple. Use the 2581 data. It shows off really well that way. Okay. All right. That's all I had, folks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Let me reshare my screen. I think, Hemant, you're up. I think we want to talk about, I think you're the best person, honestly, to talk about uh, Industry 4.0 um, and how 2581 helps. Can you do that? Sure, sure, absolutely. So uh, many of you may have heard of Industry 4.0. It's this uh, smart factory automation uh, that many of the manufacturers are implementing on in, in their in their factories. And during inside the automated factory with Industry 4.0, they use a standard called Connected Factory Exchange. It's an IPC standard. It's Connected Factory Exchange allows uh, the various steps in an assembly line or a fabrication line to talk to each other. So through uh, Internet of Things, uh, co communication happens between machines. And this is process data uh, communicating from one machine, one, one step on a, on a factory floor to another step. Uh, what happened several years ago is we added the capability of sending IPC 2581 data from the design house to a specific machine on the factory floor. Uh, and basically the machine can act, ask for the 2581 data that's required for that particular step. So think of it as a pick and place machine requiring the data. Pick and place machine can request the data from the design house through a CFX or connected factory exchange messaging me method. And the design house can send that data to the machine in 2581 format through the CFX message. So this is the way we connected the connected factory exchange, which makes the uh, factory uh, a smart factory to 2581. So that's what we did. And essentially the idea is to reduce uh, the amount of data that's sent to the factory floor and only send the amount of data that's necessary for a specific step. So this, uh, connection between IPC Connected Factory Exchange Standard and IPC 2581 has been made 
uh, and has been implemented and has been released uh, for a few years now. One other so aspect, one other yeah, aspect of that is with this uh, 4.0 vision is if you've ever been on a contract manufacturer's floor, and I'm sure Amit can talk to this too, is you end up having somebody over, they all they need is solder mass data. Do you really want your entire uh, manufacturing output going to them? No, you just want them to have the solder mass data because they're doing solder mass inspection. Um, when you have somebody doing uh, final QA on something, they only need the outer uh, the outer layers and the actual components. It's limiting exposure of data to wherever it's going, no matter where it is. So they only get what they really need. And that's huge. Um, it's very often, uh, quite literally, being on the contract manufacturing floor, my office used to open up onto um, my, in my previous position. I, I, they, I would watch what they would do on the on the operators, and they would literally take it and kind of go, well, I don't need this. I don't, what is that? I'll play with it a little bit and they screw stuff up or they get the wrong data or they use the top instead of the bottom or whatever. And they used wrong pieces of data inside of the Gerber files. 2581 solves all that because they only get what they're supposed to get. It makes it simple. It makes everything work faster and you don't get that five, five o'clock phone call on Friday from the, from the CM or from the fab shop going, mm, we're not sure about this. Uh, yes, I think that's a huge benefit coming from a manufacturer standpoint. Um, just as a couple more helpful slides here. Um, so this is the data that can come over with um, 2581. They can see a lot more rich information um, and all the information we talked about. So it's kind of like a summary slide. And then someone asked what was the difference between the formats. So we've outlined here. Uh, some of the differences. Uh, hopefully you can, you know, take something like this and, and use it as an internal selling point if you're not the decision maker in your company um, and you need to educate other people, this would be a good place to, um, to start off with. And I think, you know, something that's not here is that, hey, this is an open format, and an open standard. And, you know, right now it's Siemens, and then it could be another company later that tries to control the interaction between a fabrication house and the designer. And again, you have to be wary. Are they working off of open source platforms or not? Is it, are, is it their own, you know, proprietary, um, you know, software and standards, or is it are they working off of the open standard? So I think that's a very important question that everyone should be asking, both from a fabricator side as well as the customer side. And if I can allude to that just a little bit, yeah. listening to the 2581 consortium meetings and anybody who's in, if you want to attend, please, please reach out to us. It would be fine. Um, it's fascinating because you get people in industry that are building boards all the time and it's a constant development and a constant evolution. As new technology comes up, we talk about it and it really is applied almost real time. And what I one thing that's fascinating is, is as this comes up, you see that the, the standard is written really, really well. Emmett has done an amazing job at pulling this thing together that a lot of the nuances and new technologies already have a way of actually being put in to the current standard. And the ones that are gonna be modified for the next version, because there's always gonna be a next version, is, is like, okay, we need to make a little tweak here, a little tweak there to make it a little bit better. Um, it, it's quite literally, it's so much different than the ODB++, which you have no idea what the standard looks like. I actually have the book sitting right next to me. It always sits next to me. That tells you exactly what the entire schema is. It's public. Great. We can take a look at it. You can look at it. You can look at the XML file and figure it out. ODB, you, you have no idea. It's a black hole you're putting stuff into. Do you really want your data going into a black hole? Not really. So just, just one addition to what Patrick said, it's it's not Heyman doing the work. It's a group of companies that represent the PCB design and supply chain companies. It's the OEMs, it's the software companies, it's the manufacturing companies. Everybody comes together as an industry group. It's a collaboration group. So a lot of companies, a lot of people put in a lot of effort in developing the standard. But at the point that Patrick is making, it's an open standard by the industry for the industry. So there's no one person behind it. It's a lot of companies that represent the consortium. And then it goes into the IPC standard um, uh, revision process and is done by the IPC process. 
So everybody gets into it and it's a collaborative effort. It's a very good effort. It's a very good collaboration between companies. And anybody who has any questions or issues using 2581 uh, can come to the consortium, ask for help. And the consortium members, because they represent the entire supply chain, somebody or the other will know how to solve your problem. So I think that's a great uh, support system that the, the companies in the consortium have uh, that you know is unlike uh, going to a, a vendor to asking them to solve a software bug. This is much, much more um, reliable, much, much more faster. And you have expert at every step of the way uh, for the entire process. So it's it's truly for the industry, by the industry. Uh, and that's what's unique about the IPC 2581 standard. Uh, thanks. thanks for that, Hannah. And also, could you address uh, in loving memory, um, Michael Ford? Yes. Yes, uh, so Michael Ford um, was part of Aegis Software. They supply MES software, manufacturing execution systems software uh, to the manufacturing industry. He had been part of the consortium, Aegis was part of the consortium, and Michael was very active uh, and um, uh, very uh, strategic in the way he worked with different things. And he was very instrumental in connecting the connected factory exchange with 2581. The example I talked to you about how a pick and place machine can request the data from the design house. That was Michael's vision. That was Michael's idea. And he worked with this connected factory exchange committee members to include a message that allowed the machine to ask for the 2581 data in connected factory exchange message protocol. Um, he uh, suddenly passed away uh, and uh, he's presented lots of papers at PCB, PCB West, uh, also at IPC Apex. Uh, he was very, uh, uh, very instrumental in, in making a lot of uh, standards uh, work within IPC. Uh, we will really miss him uh, and his contribution, really deepest con condolences for his, his family and friends and colleagues. Uh, thanks, thanks, Hannah. Thanks for saying that. Um, and you know, going, I don't know, is this a good place to end? Uh, basically, if you have more questions, there's my contact information. Um, you know, there's a lot of resources on our website as well. Um, here's some of the reference material that I uh, was used to put together the presentation. Again, all some of our Sierra blogs and other resources out there. Uh, so yeah, I think this is a good place to end. Anybody has any other questions uh, that they want to put in the Q&A? There were a lot of questions we answered as we were going along, about 18 of the questions being answered. Yeah, I think we, we answered as we went along. Will you be sending the Q&A back to the attendees? Yeah, to everyone. Yeah, everyone will have yes. all of that. Great. That'll be great. Okay. Like one. All okay. right. Thank you, everyone. Oh, wait. Do we have one more question? Oh, no. Excellent webinar. Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Vince. Thank you, Heman. Thank you, Hamid. Thank, Thank you for organizing the webinar, Lucy and Amit. Thanks, yeah, everybody. Thanks for Come joining, on, guys. That was great. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.